Hey, aloha, everybody. Michelle Melendez with Blossom Inner Wellness and StandTogetherHawaii.com. And this is also on the Voice of Kona Radio, 100.5 FM. Mahalo so much if you're listening on the radio on the islands. And if you're watching on YouTube, if this story speaks to you, if this information touches your heart, please give it a like and a share and a comment. Let me know how, it, how this uh, information comes across to you. Today, I'm super excited because I get to interview... Uh, just Margie and Jack Flynn, and they really are two heroes and patriots of the United States of America. They have a uh, website called Citizens of the of the American. Um, Margie, can you tell us what that what that website is? Citizens of the American Constitution dot net. Citizens of the American Constitution dot net. They have been helping people bring back the original constitution to the United States because the United States has been taken over by elite bankers. And, I, and I'm writing a book right now with two other amazing ladies, and it's going to be out in the next um, month, in the next 30 days or less. And it, it goes through all about understanding how the United States was taken over. But maybe we can also mention that here because it's really hard for people to believe that the United States was taken over, but it was. And uh, the, I do want to do a quick shout out before we get started to the sponsor of my channel because I do this on my own time. And Ace of Coins does sponsor my channel. If you want to learn about how to lower your taxes or eliminate your taxes lawfully, if you want to learn how to buy Bitcoin tax-free, if you want to learn how to license your face, your image that big tech is using to profit from, then you'll want to check out aceofcoins.com, A-C-E-O-F-C-O-I-N-S. Let them know Michelle sent you. All right, so let's get started. Uh, Jack and Margie, whoever wants to share, let's just start with how did the United States get taken over by these elite banking, this, these elite bankers that are foreigners? They're not even part of the United States of America. Never were. Margie, you can start, then I'll finish up. This is a long story. Okay, and I'll try to make it as short as I can. Way back, even before we were a country, uh, a separate country from England, our nation, our funding nation, if you will, was being funded and set up as a business by the elite bankers. They were the ones with the money. They were the ones with the power and the influence. So they were behind the scenes working through other people. And when we had our revolution, they funded both sides of that revolution as they fund both sides of every conflict because they make money. They're not interested necessarily in any particular outcome unless it benefits them and they usually arrange for that to happen one way or another but it's like hedging your bet on both sides the bottom line is once the country was formed part of the deal behind the scenes the usual back channels was to insinuate a central bank into this country but give the people the illusion that they were free of england that they were free of all of that banking father all and that they were going to be independent. The idea was to give them the incentive to work hard and really create the so-called greatest countries on this earth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened over time. It's a lot easier to get people to do things if they think they're doing it for themselves. Yes. And if you don't see the bars on the window because you think you have freedom or liberty, you don't realize that you are actually a slave in the service of these evil masters. And that's basically what everyone is. And as you probably know, and your listeners and watchers probably know too, everybody in this world is in some kind of debt, at least most people are. And that's what helps make the system go on. The whole system is based on debt. The whole system is a fraudulent system. The banking system is a farce. And when time passed and the Congress and the nation began to realize that they were indebted to this central bank, which is a private central bank out of the city of London, owned by the central bank. They decided they weren't going to renew the charter. And that was what was the actual reason behind the War of 1812, because they were threatened. Either you renew our charter or we're going to destroy you. And they almost- Marie, can you bring the, the mic a little bit closer? <clears throat> sure. There, there you go. That's better. Thank you. They almost did destroy our country because they, they attacked us mercilessly and they destroyed a lot of important documents when they did so. And one of the things that happened was the original 13th Amendment got taken out and a new one came in that was supposedly 
to uh, free the slaves. And that's a whole other story. I don't want to get off on change. The bottom line is it was all manipulation. And then it came back to the so-called modern age when the preacher from Jekyll Island was um, written by Ed Griffin. He very, very nicely, okay, excuse me just a second, I need this dog was chasing my cat and he was coming to get him, so okay. Didn't want to have a, a tragedy when she got out. Anyway, that cat's up the tree and she'll stay there for a while. She's smart enough. To okay. <laughs> anyway, um, the story of Jekyll Island is simple, right? Some people behind the scenes, there was a senator and some bankers got together and planned the coup by which they would steal our entire treasury and they would give all of our, our, our country money to this private bank and they gave them the printing press and everything else that went with it to create what they called the Federal Reserve Note. Now a note is debt, it's not money. But they Did made you guys that, hear that? You guys hear that? A note yeah, is a debt, it. it's not money. That's right, that IOUs in your pocket, they're not really money. And what happened was the people did not know about this. They thought everything was the same because, first of all, people did not have necessarily the interest in what was going on with the Florida people. And secondarily, communications weren't as readily then as they are now. So what happened? This became custom and practice. Any old bills were withdrawn and the Federal Reserve note was made the legal tender. So it's a fiat currency because it's by order. Okay, this is the money that you can use. And unfortunately, Americans did not realize what was going on. So at that point in time, we call it the biggest act of piracy that ever took place. We basically gave this private bank the keys to the financial kingdom of America, right? And they've been running the show ever since with their fraud. And when, and when you think of what they do, the, the amount of so-called fractional reserve banking that takes place every day, all of it predicated on money, printed out of thin air, which means it has no intrinsic value. It's 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 a it's a house of cards. It's the worst scheme ever, but it's the way this country has been running for all of these years since 1915. And incidentally, that's the same. Well, I mean, in terms of the right. later bit, and in terms of the federal income tax, that's when the 16th Amendment was supposedly passed, but it never actually was fully ratified. So it really is not a lawful amendment. And even if it were, the Supreme Court has ruled that it created no new authority for Congress to tax the people. So I, I went because we just had tax season just now, I and mean, yesterday or whenever Monday was. Um, and so I want you to, to say that one more time because the 16th Amendment uh, was put through in Congress because Congress, it wasn't ratified, which means many, the states were not states. in agreement with this. That's right. They weren't in you agreement because. It go, went against the original Constitution. That's correct. And the original Constitution does not allow for the people to be taxed directly in this fashion. So it's an unlawful tax. And the government, quote unquote, the corporations that masquerade as government, they know this, but they look the other way and they play their little games. And that's a subject for a different time anyway. But what we have basically is the money powers who have absolute control over this country over every institution of this country. And when you own the money, and you control it, who gets it and how much? You can literally play God for people. And if anyone runs afoul of the money holders, they usually don't fare very well, which is why so much criminality is taking place right now in our country. Congress, their souls, the governors are souls, the local senators and representatives are souls. The local cities, you know, the boards, whether they are uh, select people or commissioners or whatever, they're sellouts too. And they're all taking orders from the top. Yep. And the top, you know, are the globalists. And the globalists are one in, in all with the bankers in this, what I call a ruthless plan of global domination that we will be totally, will be a, a, a technocracy, okay, which is something that. When, when it was first proposed years ago, it sounded cool. Oh, no, all these technical right. advantages, it's not. It's an invasion of our privacy and it's an invasion of our bodies and our health. All of this 5G and everything else is all interrelated and it's all being funded 
and ordered and controlled by this handful of bankers who mm -hmm. chose. And I think there's some entity above them that isn't on our earth right now who calls the shots to them. But they're the ones that got the money and the power and the influence to control America and essentially the entire world. So that, that's where we are. We got here because our country was sold out from the very beginning, behind the scenes. Some of the founders were king's men. They were not men of the people. And they cut the deal with the king and with the Bank of England and the people who own those banks to basically take control of America. And they've done yep. so ever since. And the average American has not one clue about this. And that's speaking get ahead. No. Absolutely. And speaking of selling out, I just want to share because uh, my screen really quick with people and let them know about this um, this bill that was passed. It's a bill that is allowing for Hawaii Electric Company to uh, bill regular people, increase their rate for wildfire protection on Maui. Can you believe this? This is such a slap in the face. 1,100 pieces of testimony against this bill went missing for days this um and i just this is what i'm this is what we're talking about selling out because this chairman uh let's see y yamashito he's the one that oh he didn't he 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 just they misplaced 1100 voices that said this is we we oppose this so uh this is ellie cochran who's very much a stand for the people state representative of lahaina but um she says that a testimony of 1,100 Lahaina fire victims was ignored by the House Finance Committee uh, during this passage of this bill that's going to increase their electric bill. So that's what we're talking about, selling out. So what is so amazing about having these two amazing patriots on this interview and on this channel is that they have been helping people for 70 years to fight back. And to take back our and to, to go back to the original constitution. So I would love for you guys just to share in a nutshell the, the process. You've shared this many times, but just the process. And then I do want to go into the successes you have had doing this because a, a lot of times people are afraid to try this. You know, it, it takes some effort. You do have to do paperwork, but this is our kuleana. This is ours, what is ours to do. So just in a nutshell, how, how do you guys do this? and then to share with us some successes. All right, I can get into that. But first of all, let's pick up a little bit on what Marty said. The nation was founded as a scam. The United States of America was founded as a fraud, okay? People think it was the greatest country ever devised on the face of Europe, and it could have been, had the people taken hold of their own government. But the people never take hold of their own government. Let's face it, since the very beginning of time, okay, well, let's go, if we go back to the very beginning, when creation was first put together by divine spirit, the creation was a beautiful, beautiful piece of uh, legislation, creation, whatever you want to call it, okay? It was a panacea. It was wonderful. But, Goodness has always been opposed by evil, and goodness does nothing to stop evil, and goodness has proven that forever, because goodness has never once stopped evil, not once. Maybe on, on an individual basis it has, but it's on a communal basis, on a nation basis, on a universal basis, goodness has never stopped evil once. So the bankers, who were thrown out of England many times. Yes. And brought back by Queen Elizabeth and John Day, who was essentially a banker. Okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of an echo on the mic. I don't know if you can plug that in or not, but go ahead. Okay. Keep going. She can see us. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's a lot better. I don't know what I, you just did. I just okay. fixed it. I just fixed the mic. Okay. okay. All right. There we go. How about that? The mic is done. Yeah. Anyway, John Day, who was the advisor to Queen Elizabeth, who was a banker himself, and a sorcerer, and a Satanist. And Maybe you can turn it down a little bit. It's like, it's it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit too loud. No. Okay, okay. let's try that. And one of the SOB, 
brought the bankers back into England, okay? Well, within 20 years, they basically owned England. That's they took control of almost everything. And James, the fellow who succeeded Elizabeth, was not a friend of the bankers, but he was basically impotent. He really didn't know how to get rid of them. His son Charles, when James died, Charles I took over the kingship of England, and he directly opposed the bankers. But the bankers opposed him and put up their man Cromwell to do so in the Roundheads and had a so-called revolution in England. There was no revolution in England. It was a takeover of England by the bankers, the bankers. And they beheaded Charles I. All right. So that's the beginning of how this affected us. All right. The crown and the bankers were in the same boat, the same position. So they came up with an ingenious idea to establish this country now called America, the United States of America, as a slave state, but unknown to the people, okay? Oh, pretending, pretending to give the people power and authority. The people have never had power. They've never had authority. They've had the opportunity to have power and authority, but they never accepted it once, not once in the history of this nation. So what they did was bring in their first man. It's now, it's it's still, something's going on. Okay, maybe turn it down just a little bit more because it's I, it's making a funky. Hang on a second. Let me bring this up so I can do it. Sometimes it's it just, yeah. Because when you're talking, it's it's making it ver reverberate. All right. So maybe if you turn it down a little bit, it'll. A little bit better? Because it's, it's better than it. Yeah, there we go. I think that's okay. better. All right. So the revolution. Although many people think that was a glorious revolution that fought for freedom, which it was by the people who fought it, but they didn't know they were fighting a phony revolution, okay? And that's with every war. They don't know really what they're fighting for. Yeah, they, they, they don't know to. nothing about that's it. Right. This is how <laughs> stupid, I hate to say it, Unaware. but it's how stupid Unaware. Unaware. and ignorant the people are. Well, they've been bamboozled. We've been bamboozled. Well, they have. Because they give their power away all the time. They never take their power and internalize it within themselves. They always give it away. They've been too trusting. Okay. So in every fight, every revolution, every war, which are all a banker's mm -hmm. wars for bankers' right. benefit, okay, the ones who fight are fighting for the bankers. They're not fighting for themselves. They don't They're fighting for the bankers. Yeah. How stupid is that? They don't realize If it, you no. support your own enemy, you're a fool. Okay. Yeah, but people don't yeah. know that. So so I would love to go go back to how you guys are helping people because you guys have helped a lot of people, like over 250 successes. Oh, more than that. More than that. More more than that. It's, it's By now, that was really on. Now. Yeah. We've got about 10,000 people, roughly, who have used our methods Over to find decades. great success. But my point is this, the people don't know the country is a fraud. The yeah. people don't know the country is a scam. And if you don't know it's a scam, and if you don't know it's a fraud, you can't do anything about it because you think that the country is doing the right thing for you when the country has been opposing you from the very the beginning. The whole time, the whole time. So from the very beginning, our country has been a fraud. Now, the people who fought the revolution thought they were doing the right thing, okay? And from their point of view, they were. But they were taken advantage of by the bankers, by Washington, by his cronies, and we've had a central bank, a foreign-owned, Central Bank, okay, controlled by outside bankers from 1791 on in this country, okay? It has never stopped. Yeah. Now, Jackson, President Jackson, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson uh, was asked on his deathbed what his most famous position was ever best achievement. achieved. Yeah. And he said, I killed the bank. Well, he did kill the bank. He killed the second bank that was brought in because, as Margie mentioned earlier, the War of 1812. We dropped the original charter from 1871, expired in 20 years. Congress refused to renew it. 1791. Please. Got the wrong date. All right, 1791. 1791. Congress refused to renew it, okay? England said, and the banker said, look, Unless you renew the charter, we'll blow the hell out of you. 
So that was the reason for the War of 1812. Well, we were beaten by England. This was a real war. It wasn't a phony revolution. It was a real war. England was winning. We said, okay, quits. We'll set up a central bank, which was the second central bank set up by the country. Jackson killed that bank, but he gave the power that that bank had to all the central banks. The state, yeah. The state banks and the central banks in the states, okay? So those banks did the same thing that the original two banks did in this country, the first two central banks, all right? And that went right up to 1913, when officially it was declared that the Federal Reserve Bank was the bank of the United States and it controlled everything. These banks print money out of nothing. You must understand that, folks. They print money out of nothing. No gold, no silver, no copper, no uranium, nothing backs it except the pieces of paper. And the government says, by fiat, this is the money you must use. It's the biggest piece of piracy we've ever had in the history of the world, yeah. okay? And, the, and just because it says federal doesn't mean it's part of the government. It's that's right, correct. It's not, it's private. That's correct. So anyway, that's a brief background to pick up a little bit on what Margie said about the scam that is the United States of America, and it's still a scam. Now, getting into your position just before we get into our successes, Testimony means nothing. It means zero, as you found out. Yeah. All testimony means zero, okay? In some cases in court, some testimony can be effective. Our testimony has been very effective because our wins are about 100%, okay? Yeah. No one else in the history of this country has had that win. And no one else in the history of the country does what we and our people do before the courts and before government. And that is to use the power and the authority of the Constitution against the unconstitutional actions committed by government, okay? And, you know, we've got more than 250 victories. It's probably well over 10,000 now. We don't keep wow. count. The figure you were using is from about 25 years ago. Yeah, okay. it was on your website. Yeah. So it's, it's broadened basically beyond that, well beyond that. However, this is the key. We have the method, and again, we have only devised methods based upon the original constitution, okay? We didn't write the original constitution, the forefathers did. So we have devised methods that the forefathers would have used in the courts and against government to reinstate the power and the authority of that constitution and the rights guaranteed to the American people by that constitution. We've been very successful, however, 10,000, 12,000, whatever, 20,000, whatever it is, doesn't compare to three and a half million people. So we have the methods, we have the track record, it's proven, it's there for anyone to see, yet the people don't care about that well, because unfortunately, no matter what anyone thinks, the American people don't give a damn about their own country. I think they do. I, they just don't know what to do. Because for me, I was a lost soul. I was a lost soul. I would have taken the V, um, at, I, you know, for eight, the past, I'd say eight or nine years, I finally have been waking up. You know, I believe the whole what happened with the two towers, the, the twin towers. I believe that whole story, even though I was even though I did have a question, I was like, how does how do they fall in their own footprint? And then uh, 10 years ago, a friend of mine had me watch it had told me michelle i'll pay you a hundred dollars to watch this movie and i watched zeitgeist and i i cried for three days i was i cried like i a, a, like a baby like i couldn't get out of bed i was depressed i was like oh my god i get it now and i see and so now what we're doing what do we do but you guys what you have the successes you've had is so incredible um, so I do want to, what is the process of it? The first is an affidavit, which I've written to the governor. Then I cannot take the governor to civil, civil action, civil court, because I'm not on Maui. I don't have standing. I can take the Big Island County Council yes. to civil court, which I will be doing because they have absolutely violated the Constitution. The people on Maui should be taking the governor as well as all of these people who are disregarding uh, their their testimony, 1,100 testimony goes missing. That person needs to be taken to civil court. Um, so tell us a little bit about the procedure of how you do this. So you have an affidavit of truth. What is that? 
All right, first of all, who told you you don't have standing to bring the governor to court? Um, Whoever told you that is wrong. Okay. wrong. Oh, I do, even, even though I don't live on Maui. It doesn't matter. You could live in Georgia and still bring action against the governor. Okay. okay. All right. One American is hurt by unconstitutional actions of any governor. Any American is hurt. Okay. Anyone live in Hawaii. He is the governor of Hawaii. So whoever told you that is wrong. Okay. I don't care who he is. It, he it was, it was, a, it was a, it was a lawyer and it was a, uh, so you're right. Cause I'm like, why am I listening to the lawyer and the, uh, the person it, that helps them? The their teeth, okay. Now there are some good lawyers out there, but 99.9% .9 lie through the teeth. They are members of a mafia organization that's centered in the city of London and given credence by the Jewish government in this country. It's a scam. The whole thing is a scam. This is what we're trying to get across to people. Don't believe any crap that the government tells you. They're lying through their teeth. And it's they true. lie through That's their true. teeth forever. Now it's up to the people to hold them responsible for those lies. So let's get into what, we, what we've done. All right. First of all, we're based on the power and the authority of the national constitution. That national constitution is the original organic constitution of this nation. Okay. 1787 as amended with the Bill of Rights in 1791. It's called the Constitution for the United States of America. That is a national constitution. All right. Now, you can find probably 30,000 people across the country who know this. All right. Because most people, virtually all people in this country, take their allegiance to the U.S. Constitution, which is not the national organic constitution right. of 1787. So tell but, us the date of the second constitution. 1871. 1871. It was put together by a Congress in 1871 that had taken allegiance to the original constitution by swearing an oath to uphold it forever. So that Congress in 1871 created an unconstitutional, fraudulent, communist constitution or corporate constitution that created the corporate state throughout America that was finalized over several years and finally completed in 1871 or 1878, I should say. Okay. So that corporate constitution defies the original constitution. The Congress that created that constitution, the phony constitution, Sworn out to the original constitution, as I said, but betrayed defied it. their oaths betrayed and betrayed the original constitution when it created the corporate constitution. Right. And every governor, every president, every congress, every politician mm -hmm. has upheld that treasonous constitution ever since. All the oaths that are taken in this country are taken to the treasonous constitution. You can't find 300 people in the country that know that. Yet the people have accepted all this fraud forever. They never questioned it. They've so, accepted it. And so, but I want to get into what, because I know you guys only have 30 minutes, and yeah. I really want to get into your, so you do the affidavit, which is the affidavit of truth. And you guys, I, I wrote a complete affidavit. If you go to standtogetherhawaii.com forward slash actions, I have the affidavit. It's 17 pages long. This is a, this was held, this was created because of their template, Jack and Margie's template. And then what I did is I went in and I wrote all of the violations that the governor had made against the original constitution and the people. And I submitted that to him. Now, after that, um, and, and a lot of people have done that as well. After that, the next step is to, to file a case with civil court. Is that correct? There are two things. Well, there are several things you could do. Filing a case, yes, of course, is the main thing. However, uh, Hawaii at one time had sheriffs. You no longer have sheriffs. They knocked that constitutional position out. However, you have an attorney general. Okay. Yeah, I've the contacted highest, them. Who's the highest law enforcement officer in Hawaii? And I guarantee you, he's a criminal communist, an absolute criminal communist, probably put into power by Soros and his machine. And this is what I mean. The American people don't stop these guys 
from taking office. They allow them to take office. And as soon as they take office, they go against you. However, yeah, what you true. could do, number one, is write an affidavit, as we mentioned before, to this attorney general and write an affidavit to the attorney general of the United States. These are corporate people working in corporate offices. However, they've still taken oaths, okay? Yeah. Maybe they're the phony constitution, but they've taken oaths. Therefore, pursuant to their oaths, they have no constitutional authority whatsoever to uphold the unconstitutional criminal actions of the governor. And if they do, they're complicit in, condone, aid, abet, and are doing the same thing he's doing. Okay, yeah, and I've done fine. that. I forgot to tell you, I have done that. So I've written Good. to the governor. I sent that affidavit not only to the attorney general, to the generals that are in the state of Hawaii, to the state representatives, to the state senators, Good. and to um, yeah, his entire cabinet. I think I think I sent it to all of them. Excellent. So that's so, the next thing to do. When those people that you wrote to take no lawful action based Which upon your affidavit, then, as I said before, they condone, aid, and abet, and are complicit in unconstitutional actions, okay? Now, that's step one. Step two, you not only sue the governor, you sue all of them. Okay. All of them, okay, in federal court. And you do it yourself. You don't use an attorney, all right? Mm -hmm. This is what people have to understand. They can't use attorneys because the attorneys in work on for it. the bar. Yeah. The, the bottom line is this. The criminals are guiding the criminals. Okay. The criminals are the gatekeepers for the criminals. So the criminals who are all members of the corporation do not act for the benefit of the people. They act for the benefit of the corporation. So they dump you. So if you speak for yourself and we can... Don't Give me some pointers on that because you've won a bunch of cases, yeah. okay? And you hold the judge to the constitutional mandates imposed upon him immediately, and I'll tell you how we do it. Well, first of all, we set up the affidavit, all right? Yeah. The affidavit is the premier thing. The affidavit sets up the case, okay? When our opponent never rebuts our affidavit, then pursuant to the lawful warnings contained in that affidavit, he admits to all of the crimes, the unconstitutional actions, all the chicanery that we spelled out in our charges against him. And we've told him or her that he, if he disagrees with anything, he must rebut that okay. with which he disagrees by means of his own sworn notarized affidavit. We have people who probably done over 100,000 affidavits over 70 years, not one affidavit, yeah. not one has ever been rebutted, okay? So the affidavit is very powerful. The affidavit stands as fact and truth before the court, okay? Now, the court theoretically convenes to hear matters in controversy and hear the truth. The court runs from the truth, you and the court it. does not want to hear matters in controversy, mm -hmm. okay? Because the court is a criminal corporate organization, and you yeah. have all these corporate whores, and that's exactly what they are. As I said before, the girls walking the street are much more honest than these, these whores <laughs> during true. the office. That's I hate true. to say it, but that's true. that's true. So what we do when we go to court, we've set up the affidavit, and the affidavit stands as fact and truth before the court. Now. The court is not going to give that to us. We have to push that we position. We not only demand it, we push it, okay? We shove the Constitution down their throat and up their backsides so it meets them somewhere in the middle, gives them a real bad stomachache, all right? <laughs> now, in Hawaii, people have used this with success. Yes. And judges have stepped down because they will not support the Constitution and they've been disqualified. All right, so tell, us, tell us a story about that because you guys have some great stories about that. And with the, I think it was a guy in Oahu that you shared it was with. Not actually, in Maui. All right. Ma okay, share that story. In one issue, there are many issues there, but this one issue, he had a fairly large estate in Maui. With it was a walled estate with seven or eight homes on it, so it was worth a lot of money. All right, nice fellow, but very naive. He attended one of the seminars we did in Maui, right? And he said, oh, Jack, they're not all bad. Come on, you, you, you're you not right. They must be good people. I said, they're none. They're evil. They're all evil across the board. 
even if you're good, if you support the evil system, you're evil. There's nothing good in you. The cops are evil. The judges are evil. The janitors are evil. I don't care who it is. The secretaries are evil. Anyone who works for an evil system is evil. That's what we must understand. Okay? So. You had a hard time with that. He did. Anyway. Citibank, which is one of the largest, well, one of the largest banks in the world, came after him, and they hired a firm on Hawaii known as the Dang Law Firm, which is a very powerful political firm from what we understand, never lose cases. So they brought a case against this fellow for money, a fairly large amount of money. And if he lost the case, he really lost his estate, which would have been horrible. So as a lot of people do, after they don't, understand what we're saying initially he came to us and six months later when this happened and said i'm in trouble will you help me so we did okay we showed him how to win the case how to speak how to present this how to do that and this fellow named miles when he went to court okay was facing a judge who was known as a money man all right you know what a money man is all right famous money man all right and the Dang Law Firm, which never loses cases as a political law firm, for what I've understood, that's what people have that's told me. Told us, yeah. And Citibank, one of the largest banks in the world. A big estate is in question. All right, who's going to win here? Well, if you're a gambling man, you're going to say the Citibank's going to win. Citibank didn't win. Miles won, okay? The judge initially in that trial came out like a bore. He was going to attack Miles and rip, rip him apart. Miles used on him what we use in every case. So tell us what the first thing he said to the judge, because okay. that's, that's one of my favorite As parts. soon as the judge convenes the court, he'll look at the U.S. attorney or whoever's speaking for the government or the opponent. Is the government ready to proceed? That idiot will say, yes, your honor, government's ready to proceed. Mr. Flynn, are you ready to proceed? No, sir, not at this time. We have some matters we must clarify before we go further. And I have that right under due process of law, okay? And it's always, sir, or madam. It's never your honor. That's a title of nobility. If that guy sitting in the bench doesn't know us, he'll say, usually, go right ahead. So we say, you and the U.S. attorney have taken oaths to support and uphold the national original organic constitution. I've just made a statement based in truth, fact, law, and evidence, which is very important. Yeah. When you're in court, you have to base yourself in truth, fact, law, and evidence. And then I asked the confirming question, is that correct? We never ask an open-ended question. We make a statement, and we ask the confirming question to the statement. Well, if the guy's not an idiot, he'll say, yes, yes, okay. So right away, we say, with all due respect, you and the U.S. attorney must abide by those oaths in the performance of your official duties, especially in this particular matter. I love it. A statement based in truth, fact, law, and evidence. Is that correct? When he says, yes, we just won our case, not officially, but after five or ten minutes, we win a case. Because we have a constitution far better than those fools opposing us, the attorney, you know, that gets paid, I know, $5,000 a day or something or an hour. <laughs> and the judge, who doesn't know crap, and he's a, he's a political whore, mm. okay? He doesn't know the Constitution at all. We do. So as soon as they go outside the Constitution, we bring them right back to the Constitution. So they have no position. They're in the constitutional corner, all right? Yeah. We win the case. Now, what happened with Miles is this judge started playing with Miles, say, and he said something like here, I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to uh, adjudicate this matter. Let's Jack, can move you push on. The, can you push the mic a little bit away from you? It's yeah. Loud. All right. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's better. Let's move on. Is that better? Yeah. Miles wouldn't move on. He stayed with his position. The judge refused to confirm the fact that he had taken an oath and would abide by an oath. Wow. So Miles disqualified him and said, step down. You are a traitor. You don't belong in that position. Step down. And that SOB stepped down. He oh, my God. That is fantastic. So Miles goes into the, uh, the clerk of the court and said, I want a, an automatic dismissal. The judge left the bench. All right. Apparently he got it. But the court called for another session the next day. Miles had to go in. 
as soon as the judge said the same thing, are you ready to proceed? Miles started to say something else to this new judge. And the well, when I say something else, the same thing yeah. to a new judge, oh. all right? And the judge said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Mm-hmm. Saputo, hold on, you don't have to say anything. You have won this case, this case is dismissed. Bang, it's over, all right? That judge dismissed the case uh, the city bank brought against Miles, all right? This is the power of the people if they use the process correctly, okay? So this is what we use every time we go to court. However, the affidavit is designed, we don't like to go to court, folks, okay? We've been in the many courts, many hundreds, thousands of times over the years. We don't want to do that. We want to stay out of court. So the idea is to get the case resolved and dismissed before you go to court if you're a defendant. If you're a plaintiff, you never want your case dismissed. You want to win your case, okay? So as defendants, we want the case dismissed, which is why we write these affidavits, okay? Now, the affidavit, again, stands as fact and truth before the court. As I said before, the court is supposed to hear the truth, the facts of the matter, okay, and the evidence. The court doesn't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear the facts of the matter. They don't want to hear the evidence, and they don't want to resolve controversies. They just want to find, if you are a citizen opposing the government or opposing a corporation or opposing a bank, they simply want to get you out of the way as soon as they can and fight for your opponent. That doesn't work with us, okay? As I say, we probably, we've lost count, but I, it's at least 10,000 or more over 70 years. But 70, but, but that amount, you know, 10,000 or what have you, pales in comparison to the population of America. Now, we've been doing this for 70 years, and you think the American people would gravitate to this and jump on this. but They, they are don't. now. They are now, Jack. Well, I know so. you're frustrated with that. I know you're, we, and I don't blame you. I don't plan your work in your effort in Hawaii and on Maui, okay, and the people you put together, we sincerely hope that the people will engage in the affidavit process, okay, yes. Yes. and use it to get these criminals out of the system. They now, have to we've, be, run, yeah. we've run so many cases, we'll only give you a few. Yeah. Uh, Maggie won a major one against a corporation. It was a holding corporation. It was, I think, the fourth largest holding corporation in the country at that time. It was called Metris. And this was about, uh, I don't know, 25 years ago, of course, to that. Yeah, 2001 or something, a long time ago. Anyway, Margie can give you the bottom line of that case. Thank you so much, Jack. That case was um, brought against me in fraud. They accused me, falsely accused me of not paying my bill on time. And they had played a little cute one. They had changed the posting date for my account, but never notified me. So my payment arrived on time. But since they changed the posting date, then they recorded it as a late fee. I got notified in the mail the next month that I had a late fee. And my interest rate went up like 20 points. So I immediately got on the phone. I said, what's this about? And I get some poor clerk and she has no clue. And I asked to speak to her supervisor who had somewhat more of a clue, but not much. And she said, well, you know, I I don't know what happened. And I said, I want you to find out why it's been posted as late because it wasn't received late. So after I was on the phone, probably 15 minutes holding, she comes back and tells me, oh, they changed your posting date. I said, how can they do that without notifying me so I can accommodate the change in date? Well, I don't know. That's not my department. I said, is there anybody else I can speak to? She said, no, I'm the supervisor here. And I said, well... I'd like you to carry a message across to your higher ups. And she said, okay. I said, tell him that I'm not paying the late fee and I'm not going to keep this card. I'm going to tear it up in little pieces. And if they don't resolve this properly, I'm not going to pay the rest of the balance because I have been defrauded and I'm not going to stand for it. She said, well, I don't have that authority, but I can convey the message. So I said, fine, do that. So shortly after I get... Let me just interject one thing, which is very important. 
The bill <clears throat> that we were supposed to pay was under $500. It was a peanut bill. Whatever it was. But the point is, we're not going to let yes. anyone defraud us, yes. and the American people should do the same It wasn't thing. a big amount of money. This, is, this was on principle. You don't know, let anybody take advantage of you, and you know you've been wronged. So I was angry about the attitude. It was very cavalier. So when I get <coughs> notified that they're going to uh, charge me and you know another late fee, and effort, I wrote them a letter and an affidavit, and I explained to them what happened and why I wasn't going to pay the late fee or any extra charges that I would I would pay my balance if they removed those. Otherwise, you know, they could go pound sand. You know, more polite words than that, but that was the essence of the message. So. Silence. I don't have a word from anybody. And then a few months later, I get a lawsuit in the mail, a complaint, blah, blah, blah. So this is going to be fun because I had written those affidavits and they never rebutted a word, not one single word. And I stated in the affidavit precisely what they had done wrong. So their silence was their tacit admission to all of the claims and charges that I made in my affidavit. So I had to um, come up with information before going to court, which I did. The first day of court was the first preliminary hearing, and this lawyer was supposed to appear in person. She doesn't show up. She's on the phone. And, and she is representing Metris, and she blathered on for, what, 10 minutes about yes. the company and their honor level and this and that and blah, blah. And they're, and they're willing to extend me every courtesy and make arrangements and blah, 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 on and on. I just sat there quietly in the room, didn't say anything. When she finished, the judge looked at me and he said, uh, uh, do you, did you have something to say, Ms. Edwards? And I said, I most certainly do. I said, first of all, you can tell Metris that I'm not interested in their terms or their deal. And you can tell them this, they're not going to get one dime from me, not one dime. They defrauded me, they lied about it, and now they're trying to cheat me. I'm not having it, so let's take this thing to trial. So the judge says, well, uh, uh, it appears that uh, Ms. Edwards doesn't want to take your offer, so I don't have any choice but to let this move forward. So he said, you'll be notified, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we set to work right away because... I did not want to go through the process of doing you know, interrogatories or depositions, which are expensive and time consuming. So I decided to make use of a, a simple uh, technique in discovery, which is called request for admissions. And what you do is you send certain statements to your opponent and you make the statements something that they cannot refute. So obviously they don't. And when I had set up buying through my affidavits, I used the same basic charges and claims in the request for admissions, which they could not answer without incriminating themselves. And they couldn't rebut because every one of my statements was true and factual and supported by the evidence. So they didn't answer the request for admissions, which means they admitted to everything. So they have two stacks against them, the affidavits and the request for admission. Now they didn't know what to do. So all of a sudden I get notified that the attorney that's representing Metris has somehow I uh, had to withdraw for personal reasons, and she's no longer representing. So she's got to a delay, so you had to find a new attorney firm. So I get a letter from another attorney firm with the same garbage. I send him an affidavit, never hear another word from him. Now the clock is moving, the trial is still scheduled. <laughs> and we go to court with, uh, what, about 20 of our students. We had about 20 of our college students that wanted to come and a few friends and neighbors that wanted to see what happened. So we show up at court on the morning of the trial. It was scheduled for 9 a.m. And I've got briefcases full of documents in support of my position. And um, I don't see anybody from Metris. And the, the judge came out of the back office two or three times, running back and forth like a chicken with his head cut off, going from one room to another, to the clerk's office and back. And I thought, he looks very stressed out. Turned out that Metris never showed up. So he came out at 9.25 and asked if he could see me. And I got up and said, yes, what is it? And he said, well, it doesn't appear that Metris is going to show up today. And I said, I would have to agree. He said, given the fact that you're here and fully prepared for trial with all of your documents and evidence, and Metris didn't even have the courtesy to tell us that they weren't going to appear, he said, I have no choice but to dismiss this case. And I said, you're absolutely right. So I said, when can I have that in writing? 
And he said, I have a day or two be okay. And he said, yeah, that works for me. Thank you. He said, well, well thank you. Uh, have a nice day. And we left with all of our kids and they're going, what happened? I said, I won because my opponent didn't have the guts to show up because he had nothing to, to uphold his end. His lie was exposed for the fraud that it was. And I won. And they were a huge company. Let me just interject here. Metris decided not to oppose us. Afraid. This is the fourth largest holding corporation in America. The they decided not to oppose us. Why? Because we had them lawfully dead to the rights. They knew it. And they knew it. Interestingly yeah. enough, at the time, there was a class action suit that was ongoing when this lawsuit was filed against me. And I called the attorney's office because I was curious about it. And he said, oh, he said, yeah. he said, it's too bad you didn't call me last week. The deadline for you know getting into it is over. And I said, oh, no, I'm not calling you for that. He said, oh, well, what, what, what can I do for you? And I explained that I was up against him as a defendant. And he said, who's your attorney? I said, me. Hey. He said, are you an attorney? I said, no, I'm not an attorney, but I'm speaking for myself. And he said, well, uh, that's really brave of you. And I said, well, um, I'm going to do the best that I can. And he said, well, let me give you some advice. He said, these guys are sharks. They love an absolute stable of the most ruthless lawyers around. They're snakes. And he said, um, they're tough. They're really tough. So he said, it's not going to be easy, and you're going to have to you know, really dot your I's and cross your T's. And I said that I would, and I thanked him. He said, will you do me a favor? He said, will you let me know how you make out? He said, because I'd like to, like to hear from you when it's over. And he said, and I truly do wish you the best of luck. So when I won, I did call his office, and he was in court that day, but I left a message with his secretary, and she remembered me. She said, oh, I'll tell him. She said, he'll be thrilled for you because he asked me just the other day I wonder how she made out if, if her case is done. And she was very pleased for me. And I think very shocked, as most people are. Because <laughs> yeah, are. I love it. But it was over. We thought it was over. The case was dismissed. Two or three months later, I get a, a motion in the mail from another, a third set of attorneys on behalf of Metris, trying to get the judge to set aside his order to vacate it and set it aside and reopen the case. And I said to Jack, I'm not going to file a reply because if I do, I will be okay. engaging. I'm going to send a notice to the court. The case is closed, blah, blah, blah. And I did. So they hold a hearing and this woman again was supposed to appear, but at the last minute she had to go to Utah so she didn't show up face to face. Again, and She started her you know, arguments and the judge said, let me stop you right there. Let me stop you. So he went through in five minutes' time the nuts and bolts of the case, making the arguments that I made, okay, in my documents, which surprised me because I didn't think he was even paying attention, but he was. And when he was finished talking, he said, look, Metris might have a problem, but their problem isn't with Miss Edwards. Their problem is with their attorneys, all of them. He said, but it's not with Miss Edwards. He said, I'm sticking by my decision. I'm not going to change my decision. My decision stands. This case is over. And we're done here. Goodbye. Click. Bang the gavel and hung up the phone. And I, and I want you just to say, in a nutshell, this judge did not like you. Well, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the side story. This, this is, judge yeah. absolutely couldn't stand constitutionalists because we would often go to court with students and other people and watch what took place. And he knew we were constitutional so that we were part of this group and uh, had students of our own. And he resented the fact that anybody would challenge his authority. He was a big man, you know. So he, we overheard him one day as we were leaving the courtroom saying that he's going to get these constitutional idiots. He thought we were a bunch of morons. So in my case, came in, I was supposed to have another judge. But when he saw it was me, he took the case over because he wanted to stick it to me. He was right? the head judge. And he was the chief that. judge. He could do whatever he wanted. So I said, oh, no, I've got this jerk, you know. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was going to be a top sell. And he was not a very nice guy and actually tried to have me killed, right, which is a whole other story. I don't want to get into that. But it, it was a very dicey time. And a lot of people warned me to be very careful because of his reputation. And thankfully, by the grace of spirit, you know, the creator who uh, looks over all of us, the creatrix, uh, I was protected and I was given the right things at the right time in terms of facts and information. And I was lucky and uh, steadfast and I won. Using the Constitution, that's why I won. And then when it was over, I filed a case against him with the Judicial Standards Commission. 
and it was loaded. And I got a call one day from the lawyer who advises this commission, because the commission are not lawyers, they're lay people. And the lawyers advise them. And he asked me right up off the bat, are you a lawyer? And I said, no. And he said, well, how did you know how to... Wait, wait what was that question again? Because I couldn't yeah. understand. He, he asked me how I knew how to structure my arguments. Was I an attorney? And I said, no, I was not. And he said, well, I have to tell you, he said, I've seen a lot of complaints come into this office. I've never seen one as thoroughly documented as yours. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, this was excellent work. And I said, thank you. And he said, well, um, I, I wanted to talk to you because I want to tell you how things work. He said, this is kind of an old boys network if you get my drift. And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, this guy is part of a, um, a group of people. I said, yeah, you don't have to elaborate. I'm on, I'm on to what you're saying. He said, what usually happens in a situation like this, when people complain to the Judicial Standards Commission, unless the judge is caught like in an act of murder or some kind of public sexual misconduct, they don't usually kick them out. But what they do, if the complainant's case is strong enough, they will take the judge aside and say, look, if... If this goes further, you're going to make us all look bad. It's going to cast a pall on the judiciary in the state. So do the right thing, fall on your sword, retire, and we won't prosecute. Nothing further will take place. So he said, what I'm saying to you is in a month or two, he said, keep your eyes peeled for an announcement that this dude is leaving his office. And he said, I wish I could say that. We were going to kick him out, but he said, that just isn't how it works in the old boys club. And I said, all right. But I said, thank you for the heads up. I appreciate it. And he said, thank you for speaking out. So sure enough, about six weeks later, announcement that he was retiring early to um, read science fiction, play with his model trains, and garden. And he was a, a moral shaker. So if you, you know, read between the lines, he didn't yeah. really... To my kid for it to retire. This judge is was the most powerful man in northern he New was, Mexico. Big time. And the strength of New Mexico is up north, the real strength, mm. if you're on the evil side. Yeah, okay. Plenty of that. And we got this you. guy out. All right. That's amazing. And we we actually got the help of the sitting governor to do At it. At the time, yeah. Yeah. Right. We made a strong case. And we actually we papered the town with flyers with all of his wrongdoing, not just against me, but lots of other people said, I'll, I, yeah, I'll talk about my case. <laughs> we put them all over the town. And I put one right on his car in the, in the courthouse parking lot. I just wish I'd been there to see his face because he thought he was off the hook because he had dismissed my case, right? But he mm -hmm. wasn't because I wasn't going to stand for his, his unconstitutional attitude. And you the guys are actually heroes. called him an unconstitutional criminal thief occupying government, uh, occupying the position of power in government. Yeah. And this was during the trial. Okay. This was not afterwards. Yeah. This was during the trial. Yeah. So pressure, even though it comes from two people, if it's the right type of pressure, can work wonders. Yes. Now tell them briefly about uh, what's the name? The editor. Yeah. yeah. To top it off, he was very good friends with the editor of the local newspaper. And his wife and, and she and her husband used to go out to dinner all the time. They were this thick. So I had gone to her previously and asked her if she would run some stories on the judiciary and things that are going wrong and how people don't get their rights upheld, et cetera. Mark, she if would, you could just move the mic a little from your, from your face. Yeah, it sounds better when it's further sure. away. She did not want to, to do it. And I told her, I said, I have documentation that supports everything I'm saying to you. And she said, well, that may be true, but I, I, I can't do it. And I said, well, you know, you're doing a disservice to the community because the community deserves to know if their courts aren't being run properly and they're not using the Constitution the way they should. She said, well, I just can't do it. I said, okay, you're lost. So after we left there and home, and I made a phone call to a company in Kentucky that had purchased this paper a few months prior. And I let them know what was going on. And I sent them a letter and follow up. And that, yeah, it was a very brief one, just stating what took place and um, that I expected them to do the right thing and, and see that she either printed the news as it pertains to this community or she'd be replaced. Two weeks later, she and her two lesser editors were all fired. 
love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, you, you guys are, as it's, it's really amazing what you've accomplished and how many people you've helped. And I know that your goal right now is, as is mine is to help this country because yes. we have like a very short time now uh, yes. before yeah. communism really does take over. Mm -hmm. And even, even recordings like this and videos like this, probably, you know, where we are being censored on YouTube. So mm -hmm. the censorship will, if, if this continues, you know, we, we could be just gone. So yes. Um, I do any, any last words? I know that I, I, I know I feel your passion, Jack and people standing up, standing up. And I'm, I'm the same way when, when the COVID started and people were, were to do, to, you know, trusting the mandates and doing mm. all that stuff. It was driving me crazy. Yeah. So I totally feel your passion with that. Um, and, uh, your guys's, your guys's website, citizens of the American constitution.net. Uh, you have a freedom school there. And I just want to thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing. And I know that I need to let you go, but any, any last words? And I want to do a quick prayer for you and for the world, for the country. We, we have a, a little more time. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, a little more time. Okay. Anything this, else you want to share? This is important. All right. The people have to understand that they have the power. All right. Yes. And if they use the power effectively and correctly, they can be successful. And if they support each other and work in collaboration, there's much support in numbers. Now, Margie and I have always worked on our own, okay? But, you know, we've been doing this a long time, so we know the ropes. The people out there don't know the ropes. I would like them to learn the ropes. They can go to our website, uh, which is citizensoftheamericanconstitution.net. We have a 20-hour teaching series. For free. You can access it's For free. free. I've gone over, I've gone through the whole thing. Some yeah. classes twice. People told us we should have charged three grand. No, we don't we don't charge money for the constitution and the work we do. All right. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is help the American people help themselves and get them to help their own country. So I'll give you one other situation that took place in Hawaii very briefly. Uh, there's a fellow friend of ours who attended our one of our seminars in Oahu a nice guy, professional fellow. He was taking a walk one time and it was near the army base. And somehow, for some reason, he was arrested. And they claimed that he was smoking pot or he distributing wasn't. pot. He wasn't doing a damn thing. This guy is an athlete, he's a surfer, he's a runner. You know, he's a good guy, he Super doesn't do nice that guy. stuff. So he knew it was a bad job and he called us and said, what am I gonna do? I said, well, look, the best thing you can do right now is to kill it because the army doesn't have any jurisdiction over you. You're an American citizen. That's what we told okay, you. You're a Hawaiian citizen. You're out walking. They grabbed you for no reason and they roughed them up, right, which they never should have done. So I said, we want you to file the affidavit, which he did, all right, and then we want you to file a motion to claim and exercise constitutional rights. Now, in the affidavit, he spelled out all the unconstitutional actions committed against him by the Army, okay? And the fact that the Army has no jurisdiction. He's not in the Army. Therefore, the Army has no jurisdiction over him, and the Army has no jurisdiction over an American citizen. And the second doc document is the motion to claim and exercise constitutional rights, which is a motion that you are claiming your rights before the court, okay? And the court will allow you to use those rights before the court. Well, as soon as the head man in the army, whoever he was, all right, the top guy, saw the motion and saw the affidavit, okay? He's the base commander, right? Yeah, he was the base commander, I believe. And he was working with the judge. He said, no, we're not going to go for this. Okay, we're going to drop the case. All right. So what the judge did was dismiss the case immediately because the army had no jurisdiction and the army did not want to lose a case in court by showing that the army was actually opposing the Constitution, Constitution yeah. and opposing the rights of anyone to argue the Constitution in his defense. Wow. So it was a hot ticket for the Army. They dropped it, and the Army's own court, which is the federal district court, the federal, not the state, district court in Hawaii, dropped 
the case, dismissed it. All right, our friend won. Yeah. Another situation, a psychiatrist in Colorado. Psychologist, yeah. Psychologist. Behavioral psychologist, yeah. Also got into trouble with the federal government for, for some stupid, ridiculous thing it I won't even insane. get into. insane. There was nothing to it. I mean, if the guy were a criminal, we're not going to help him. Yeah. But he was a citizen who was abused by the government, so we helped him. Now, he was ready to go to jail, all right? This case has been going on for something like three years, yes, a, a long, long time. Miserable. And he kept delaying it, delaying it, delaying it as much as he could. And finally, he was out of money, he was out of lawyers, he was out of patience. He didn't have a chance in hell. And the reason he called us was because one of our... Seminar attendees. Uh, yeah, yeah, a seminar attendee was a paralegal years ago in some seminar in Hawaii or in Colorado, Colorado I yeah. think. Um, told him to call us. He said, it's a last-ditch effort, but give the friends a call. They might be able to help you, okay? So what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> we knew that it was a dead deal, yeah. all right? But we knew the court was not going to deny the Constitution on the public record. The federal court is insane to deny yeah. the yeah. Constitution to which they've sworn an oath in which they must uphold to deny that on the public record. So we filed, or we didn't file, this fellow filed the motion to claim and exercise the Constitution yeah, before the court. So it's a motion to claim your rights, number one, and number two, to use your rights, to exercise your rights before the court. Well, this court that had denied everything that the defendant brought in for like three years saw this and said, holy crap, and dismiss the case right away. And we also did something else. We, we suggested to him that in addition to filing this with the court in which his case was being heard, that he file it with the administrative office of the court, okay? Yes. So yeah. overseas these courts and let them know that his rights had been violated. And he spelled it out nicely, all the wrongdoing. And they took one look at that and said, uh oh, hmm, we, we got to drop this one. So they dismissed his case. And we, we found out about it in the, the morning I was heading down to have a, a hip operation. He called me, he said, I know you guys are getting ready to leave for the hospital, so just be a minute. And I said, okay, what's up? And he said, I just wanted to give you some good news. And I said, oh, great, what is it? He said, they dismissed my case. I said, oh fantastic, gosh. congratulations. He said, uh, he said, I am over the moon. He said, I had the best night's sleep that I've had. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm still in shock, but... I just wanted to thank you guys for helping me, everything that you did. And he said, I wanted to tell you, David, the fellow who told him to get a hold of us, he had said to him, you know, maybe they can help you, maybe they, they can't, but it's a, it's, it's a long shot, so you better be prepared, get your affairs in order, because you're probably going to jail. He said, I called David as soon as, as I got the word, and he said, holy, you know what? He said, he said, this is one in 10 million. Nobody wins in federal court. Nobody, especially without a lawyer. He said, uh, he said, I, uh, congratulations. He said, I'm, I'm blown away. He said, good thing that you called Jack and Maggie. So and no, one, is no, one, no one does win in federal court if you are speaking for yourself. And you can check this out. Roughly for 35, 40 years, yeah. no citizen has I'm ever won yeah. in federal court who is speaking for himself. Our people do because we use the power and the authority of the Constitution. Yeah, okay. We hold that traitor on the bench to his oath. Love it. Now, one more, a couple more things. We don't only help people. We don't help people anymore. We can't help them anymore. Individual, because yeah. everyone who calls us wants us to do the case. Everyone who yeah. writes us wants us to mm -hmm. do his case. It's impossible. If we did this, we'd be working 24-7, 365. And we're, we're getting old. <laughs> we can't do it, okay? Yeah. But what we're trying to do is help people help their yes, country, yes. And, okay? Yeah. And when we were doing this work before, we also helped communities with various things, not just individuals, all right? Now, you've probably heard of Los Alamos National Labs. It's the largest nuclear oh, yeah. manufacturer in the world. It's in New okay? Mexico. Okay. We beat them five times. Okay. Never went to court. Didn't have to go to court. The affidavit was stop enough cold. to stop the programs. They were doing nuclear programs, Testing. this program, that program. Bomblets. I mean, it was insane. All right. And we put them on the lid, on the table, showing everyone what they were doing. 
buying through the affidavit. They didn't want to take the heat, so they dropped the programs. Yeah, right? and we got the Secretary of the Environment of that state to work with us. We, we got him to come to our town and look at all of the transgressions that were being done, pollution and so forth. And we told him, he said, is there anything else you want us to do? And I said, yeah, I want you to go to Los Alamos National Lab and hold them accountable because they're doing things they shouldn't do. And I had all the documentation. He said, you know what? He said, even though they're going to say it's a federal enclave, this is New Mexico, and I'm the Secretary of the Environment in Mexico. I'm going to do it. And he did. And he shut down several projects and made them clean up their act. And the so-called nuclear, anti-nuclear agencies that were all posturing and never did a thing were absolutely stunned that we had done this. So we, we had about five major victories against them, and that has never happened before. And it's all because we used the Constitution, and we held all of the officials to their oaths, and they knew it. We had them by the you-know-whats. So I want to hear did. about the, the one case you guys did with, I don't know if it was a county or city council with yes. 200 people there. Yeah, share, no. share that story. I'll talk about that. Now, let me tell you, this was a long time ago, okay? And there were, a long time ago, there were some people in government that respected the people. Not many, yeah. but some. Yeah. We got two of them. We got the governor of the state, and we got the secretary yeah. of the environment of the state to help us constitutionally to correct wrongs. All right? Now, the people can do this if they really want to do this. Let me get into the other situation. Uh, Pino, which was power in New Mexico, was a large conglomerate. They supplied power all over New Mexico. Very, very, politically, very politically strong, yeah. very involved. What right? are they called? PNM. Power New Mexico, PNM. What they wanted to do was take the energy they were sending to Las Vegas and sell it to California for a much higher rate. I understood it was something like 500% higher in California because there was a crisis out there. Enron. And this was during the Enron scandal. Oh. And they were mixed up with Enron. It's a horse business. The whole thing was a yeah, horse yeah. business. But the point is, they're going to sell that to California and make a fortune on it. And to substitute the power in New Mexico for the local communities, namely Las Vegas, New Mexico, they were going to open up an old plant that had been closed in, what, 1973? Yeah, it was a diesel plant. A diesel it a plant. plant. And when it was built, it was, it was there's not a lot of population there, but the town built up. And it was heavily occupied. It was a densely populated area. And the plant was on a hill. And it was going to be a diesel operation with trucks going up and down It was supposed to be natural gas. They lied. They always lied. At the last minute, they changed it to diesel. And there were a lot of elderly people who lived there. And the pollution was making them sick, lung disease and heart disease. So eventually, they did have to close the plant. Now, they wanted to reopen this dinosaur and pull all these people again. We said, oh, no, that's not going to happen. And there were other people involved who were doing the usual, what we call lame brain administrative approach, trying to be nicey nice and pat back. Oh, yeah. And they were getting nowhere. So these folks heard about us. And they asked us, we had just come back from a seminar, wasn't it? Yeah. And they called us at the last minute and said, could you meet us for lunch today? Because we have some things we have to talk about to stop this. We said, okay. Uh, we had like half an hour to meet them. We just put our bags down, went to meet them at this local restaurant, talked with them for, what, two hours. And then we said, well, you know, think about it. When, when, is, when is this meeting going to happen? They said, tonight, 7 o'clock. We're like, geez. You know, thanks for the notice, you know. Well, you know, it just kind of happened at the last minute, but can you help us? So we said, well, you better go and talk it over amongst yourself and decide, because if we're going to help you, we have to put our heads together to, to create something that's going to be useful. So they said, okay. First of all, these people knew nothing about the Constitution. Zero. Okay, Z nothing. They knew nothing about affidavits. They knew nothing about right. politicians. Right. And they were dealing, as Margie said, tootsie fruitsy, nicey nicey, yes. smiles, shaking mm -hmm. hands. Nothing. All that crap. That doesn't work with government. Yeah. Hard face, knuckle, eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose works. is what works. Yeah. And that's what we use. And we use it against government. We use it against the courts. Yeah, and it works, for God's sakes. Now, you don't want to get aggressive and pugilistic, you are, but you yeah. want to get very direct and very much in their faces. Go ahead. Well, what happened was 
We we told them that we would help them write an affidavit. They had no idea what to do. So we said, all right, we'll put the language together for you. We'll get there early. We'll coach you on how to present yourself. So we did. And we wrote a very simple affidavit that basically said to these idiots that were on this, it was what they call a board of adjustment. What they were trying to do was review a decision that the city had already made to allow the plant to open. And we wanted them to cancel that decision. So we, we phrased the affidavit in such a way that, you know, if you, you, you pull the rights of the people, blah, 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 you vote against it. Otherwise, you vote for it, this type of thing. So they had really no choice. They were put in the box. So people got up and spoke. We had coached some of these people on how to present themselves, and they did. So we got up and spoke. Finally, it was time for them to make a decision. And the, the president of this little group handed the affidavits that we had written for them to each member of the Board of Adjustment. They took one look at this and they all got white as ghosts and said uh, to, to each other and said, okay, uh, we're going to take a, a, a break uh, to discuss this and we'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes. And they left the room, went outside. So everyone was talking and buzzing. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Whatever. And we said, you know what? Uh, just, just sit tight, you know, because these folks told us that this board had never once found in favor of the people. They'd never reversed what the city had done. You know, it's a done deal and don't bother us type of thing. Remember, they came, what, I, remember what I said about the criminals protecting the criminals. Yeah, That's what thing. these boards are. Yeah. So they came back in just about 10 minutes after they had gone out the door. They all sat down. Less than that. And they said, the, the chairman spoke up and he said that the committee had uh, decided and they voted and um, unanimously that the plant would not be reopened. And that place exploded with cheers from these people. It was packed. There must have been 200 people shoved into that yeah. meeting room that night. Mm -hmm. And they were, you could hear it outside. The noise was like a happening because they were overjoyed that they had actually accomplished something together, united. Yeah. And they were thrilled because it had never happened before. Now, this plant, had it opened, would have polluted that whole area. Big time. Little kids would have died. All yes. people would have died. Mm -hmm. Natural gas was never used. Never. Okay. It would have been a total disaster for the entire town. And we stopped it. And we stopped That's it. That's fantastic. Right? So and let me ask you guys about Maui, because we are in the same boat. Well, Hawaii is in the same boat. Like they had 1,100, I just showed at the beginning, 1,100 testimonies that go missing before this bill goes passed. Yeah. So our job is to take all of the Maui, I'm sorry, um, governor, the attorney general, everybody who I've sent those those affidavits to and do a civil case against them. And also these government, these uh, county of Maui officials that are doing this crap of missing testimonies, 1100 missing testimonies. They need to get affidavits directly. Who is responsible for the testimony? Why wasn't it presented before the public? All of those things, they make positive statements. You failed to do this, you failed to do that. They're not going to be able to rebut it. Then you can hold them accountable when they don't rebut, and you can Got take it. that against them to court. And the testimony was given no due consideration. Zero. There was no due process. There was no due consideration. Yeah. Okay. And, on the and rights. what we do yeah. with, with uh, courts of people who, who against uh, go against us, which is very rare, but sometimes some of our people have some problems. So we use something, and I think I mentioned this before. Okay. We use, uh, in, in just a minute, we use something that has worked every time. Okay. And let's talk about a court that is issuing a, a, a wrong decision. All right. We present a document to them called a motion to show cause to support the unconstitutional ruling by citing findings of facts and conclusions of law based in the authority of the original organic constitution, naming the articles and amendments that uphold the unconstitutional ruling. It's impossible to do so. Completely. Wow, yeah. The Constitution That's... does not allow for any unconstitutional ruling, okay? So you, we... you guys hear that? The, say that one more time, Jack. That's really important. Yes. In this particular case against the court, and in, in your situation, it would be a little worded a little differently because yeah. it's not going to a court. But in a court situation against a bad decision, motion to show cause to support the unconstitutional ruling by citing findings of facts and conclusions of laws 
that uh, by citing conclusions of facts, findings of fact, and conclusions of, of law, okay, which is very important, through articles and amendments of the national constitution that support the unconstitutional ruling. You can't do it. That's impossible. It is impossible. So when the court cannot cite any constitutional authority for issuing their unconstitutional ruling, the ruling gets reversed very quickly. You can do the same thing with these people. Yeah, just phrase okay. differently for that circumstance. These yeah. guys, remember, remember something. This I is something that takes home for the people too. Government of right serves with the consent of the people and upholds their will. Government of wrong ignores the rights of the people, tramples upon them, and does not obey the will of the people. Now, if you had 1,100 testimonies against this situation that were not even allowed to be presented publicly, then no due process of law was provided to the people, their rights were trampled upon, and these guys all perjured their oaths of office, which Correct. means they vacated those offices. So those are the things that we would cite against them. Right, and based on that, we have to run. Okay. Michelle. Thank you so much, you guys. Thanks. I'll let you guys go and then I'll do the prayer. But much All mahalo right. to you and aloha. All right. As well. Right. Be well. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, you guys. So, last part I want to give to the speakers, but I'll, you guys can go ahead and shut okay. your computers off and, and I'm just going to do a quick prayer for, for who is ever staying on and watching. So much mahalo to Jack and Margie Flynn. So, great spirit, infinite intelligence of all things. This is quite the game we came to play and this is quite the journey. Just sending so much gratitude and so much safety and joy and healing and abundance to Jack and Margie for all of their work over 70 years of supporting the Constitution, the original Constitution of the people, for the people, by the people. And Great Spirit, I just know that each one of us is being guided by you. And I trust you. I trust you in the journey of this world and of all of the people here on the Hawaii Islands. That each one of us knows what is our kuleana, what is ours to do in this present moment, and that we do it with confidence, knowing you are guiding our steps every single way. You are guiding our words all throughout the process. And I'm so grateful because we do get to watch as these people who do not honor humanity and honor human life and honor the rights of the people, that they are peaceably removed from office or that they are voluntarily stepped down. And that this world is turned back into a place of harmony and of peace and of unity for all people. And I know that it has done great spirit. Thank you so much. And so it is. So sending you so much aloha from the big island of Hawaii. And please join Stand Together Hawaii.com. If you haven't joined that email list, please do join that. Jack and Margie's website is uh, citizens of the American Constitution.net. So you can go and find their free freedom school. Much aloha, everyone.